there. <clears throat> we were introduced to the book that's being opened in Revelation 6 and Revelation 5, well, 4 and 5. Uh, the one on the throne had a book in his right hand, sealed seven times. In chapter 5, the Lamb is the one who takes the book from him. He is the one, only one worthy to open the seals. And then in 6, we get a description of, or really this paradigm of seal opening as a expression of here are the things that have to happen before the book is opened. Okay, is I think the best and simplest way to take what's happening here. Before you're allowed to see in the book and see whose names are written in the book of life, some things have to happen first. And this is, the seals is a good way of sort of setting that up. We get the first six here, and then there's a bit of a pause, and then we get to answer a couple of really big questions that help us in Revelation. Uh, at least ask a couple of questions, and one of them gets answered um, in this chapter. Let's offer a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss it together. Our Father and our God, we are appreciative of the opportunity to gather and to worship you this morning. Father, just everything that is around us demonstrates your great power and your great wisdom. Father, you and your Son have never committed any wrong. You've only ever done what is right. And for that reason alone, you are worthy of worship, but there is so much more. Father, you have given us here in your word the really the summary of all things from the coming of your kingdom until the return of Jesus again. And these words would have given great comfort to those that read them, and they were to give great comfort to us, Father, if we would understand them. Help us as we try to do that. Help us as we try to make applications from what we see. Help us to be changed and shifted and convicted by what your word says, Father. Please, please help us not to ignore the things that are said and not just carry along blithely as if nothing's wrong. We beg you to forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I don't think there is a heavy metal band that made any kind of money that did not make a song called The Four Horsemen. All right. Metallica did it, Megadeth did it, Judas Priest did it, a bunch of other bands seemed to do it. If you want to be edgy, if you want to be, you know, I don't know, I don't know, make money, you mention somehow the Four Horsemen. It's been done in every context you can imagine. Uh, the old Clint Eastwood movie, Pale Rider. Uh, does anyone remember the name of the guy, the character in the movie? It's interesting. His name is Preacher in the movie. Yeah, Preacher is the guy that, yeah, Preacher. That's the only thing he's known by in the movie. That's right. Um, but he comes in riding on a pale horse, and so everyone knows, okay, bad things are going to happen because, one, Clint Eastwood is here. Two, he's on a pale horse. Bad stuff's going to happen. Um, even as early as uh, the 1900s or 1920s, the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, a uh, famous group of football players. Of course, there's four of them, so you name them the Four Horsemen. Um, everything you can imagine uh, has this sort of imagery in it. Um, and if you turn to a contemporary religious artwork to explain this, you get a lot of, here's what the four horses mean. Okay, And we're going to talk a little bit about what they're being used to do here in Revelation 6. And I know this is a bit small to see, and the text is exactly impossible to read. But there are a couple of things here that I did want to note with you. For one, it says, the first one, the, the writer pictures Jesus Christ. He began ruling in 1914. Does that sound odd to anybody else? Yeah. Any guess as to which religious organization would tell you that the kingdom came in 1914? The Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Because, as you can probably not read there at the very bottom, it actually says the Watchtower uh, from 2017. Um, Right. You know, you got to have, you got to have a back, always have a backup plan, yeah, you know. Backup. So um, anyway, so there's that. I want to back up and I want to do this lesson kind of in reverse. I want to look at the questions with you and then we'll come back through our observations and things like that. Because I know a lot of times we never get to the questions, so today I want to. In Revelation, what colors or what connotation does the color white have so far? Purity. Okay. What else? Holiness. Holiness carries with it. Any other connotations? Uh, there's some reference to power. 
Okay. Influence or impact or whatever word you want. All right. Um, any other ideas that carry along with white just so far in the book of Revelation? All right. You have a, you have a, a relationship with God. It's, a, it's, it's not an adversarial relationship, but, but a, a harmonious relationship with God. Okay. Yeah, they're, the people that are in white seem to be the good guys. And, and it seems to be an acknowledgement that they are the good guys. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the robes have to be made white, right? They have to be cleansed, as we've seen that before, the one who cleanses robes and things like that. So far, this idea of whoever is wearing white or white being associated in the book of Revelation with God's side of things, all right? And you see that a lot here. You're going to see that later in chapter 7 and verse 9. There's a great multitude. We're going to talk heavily about them next week, okay? That chapter 7 answers the question at the end of chapter 6, but that's another story. In Revelation 7, 9, you've got a great multitude standing before the Lamb clothed in white robes, right? And then in verse 14, we get the explanation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, okay? So the white is always associated with the good guy kind of aspect of this. Later on in Revelation 19, Someone else wears white or has to do with white. I think it's Julian's favorite lesson over the last couple of weeks, right? The rider on the white horse in Revelation 19. So that answers my question. Who is who's being described in Revelation 6? In the first couple of verses. It's Jesus. Right? Any other things in that description, verses 1 and 2, that tell you this is Jesus? Okay. He rides out as a conqueror. He is armed, right? That description of God is not unusual, okay? God is often described as being armed, and His people even as being armed in a sense, all right? Okay, so the, we get the lamb. Yeah, the lamb broke the seven seals, but like the, the thing he sees in verses 1 and 2, right? He sees the white horse. There's a crown given to him. And he's not the only one wearing a crown in Revelation, other, and he's not the only... It's not as if only good people wear crowns, right? Later on, you get a beast that's wearing ten crowns. It's like, well, that's, that's a big deal, okay? I think what you get in verses 1 and 2 is a description of Jesus, kind of how things begin. Yeah. Is the, is the bow and the arrows and all that Jesus is just uh, preparing to fight? Ready I, believe, to fight? I believe so. Conqueror, yeah. It's, he has the look of somebody going out to, to win. Very serious about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it matches the way he's described... In chapter 19, right? The one who goes out to conquer and he's, you know, dressed in a robe and all that, all those kinds of things. If we come back to our initial observation that the thing the seals represent things that have to happen before the book's opened. What's the first thing that has to happen before the book of life's opened? If this represents Jesus and it's Jesus conquering, what has to happen first? Right. The kingdom has to come. The arrival of the kingdom and its beginning of the conquering process, right? That has to happen before any seals get, before any book gets opened, reading out the book of life. So if we get that that's the image, it makes sense that it starts this way, right? This is the coming of the kingdom, and Jesus as its head, as its conquering king going forward, okay? Um, now the rest of the seals, what kind of flavor do they have? Or what, 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 uh, what, what do they kind of, what, what's happening? Yeah, so you get the good news in verse in, in seal number one, and then the rest of it's kind of like things are going terribly, right? The kingdom doesn't come peacefully. Uh, no conquering kingdom ever does come peacefully, right? There are fights, there are battles, there are wars, there are problems. And you get that throughout the rest of the seals, right? The second seal is of war and then famine and the death and, and so on, okay? Um, I answered that already. See, I'm, I'm really bad at that. Uh, what's the point of the first four seals and what's being depicted? Because it does definitely change after number four. Something different's going on. What are the first four pe seals depicting here overall? We got the first one out of the way, right? The kingdom has come, and then what? Things get bad, right? How, someone else, how do the things get bad? Like in what manner do they get bad? So war, at the very least, right? There's, there's a person with a great sword and men are going to slay each other. Okay, what else? Well, the underlying thing is that the 
They and, and they will, right? And you see that in the fifth one. Yeah, but we're building to it, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has to be bad things happening before there are punishment for bad things happening, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's I think that's the point. It's not the okay, what does it mean that he has a big sword versus a little sword? What does it mean? You know, it's it's the overall pictures that are the important ones. And the important ones is after the kingdom comes, bad things are happening. Yeah, there's something else too in those first deals that I my Bible reads that he rode out as the conqueror, bent on conquest. So it wasn't just, you know, someone who saw that he conquered. Right. So there's, with that, you get present tense, what he's doing now, and then what he's going to do. So it's not just, I'm here now doing it. It's here now, and it's going to keep going. So you get, you get both. All right. Yes, sir. The, the three horses, uh, I don't know, I, I could be wrong, but it looks more like the one begat the others. Because what happens in war? Well, when you have war, food becomes scarce. You know, so one of the horses is about the scarcity of food that's valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, a denarius per week. Well, that's the, you think about it, a denarius was a day's wage. So uh, if, if a small amount of wheat cost you a whole day's wage, how much food do you have? Very little. Yeah. Right? And then along with that comes when you have famine, what comes with it? Dead. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it seems like the three that follow the conquering, once once bad things start, they they roll into other, you know, other bad things. And I and I think the, you know, those all relate to each other, yeah. the, the coming of wartime. Yeah, they're not individual episodes. It's one thing leads to the next, leads to the next. It's a story being, being painted, right? And the story is the kingdom has come, and then the world and its ruler and the things have responded very negatively to that, right? The awful things begin to happen. I don't think it's a story of the world at large. Because who's being discussed in the first seal? The kingdom of Christ. Who's being discussed in the fifth seal? The martyrs. Not just those who have died generally in the world, but the dead in Christ. So to me, the things in the middle follow that same track. This is describing persecution, I think. Generally, they say the Pax Pax Romani came to an end about 180 AD, right? the relative period of peace in the Roman Empire. And when the Visigoths got to Rome, they didn't take Rome, but they got there. Mm -hmm. And so the, the empire was beginning, the, starting towards the end, right? right. But with that is the coming of war. Begin, people are beginning to challenge the preeminence of the Roman Empire now. It's being right. nibbled on by other other nations. And, and I just wondered if, you know, some of these visions here are relating to the fact that the peace that, that was enjoyed when the, when the gospel kingdom went out, it's going to come to an end. Yeah, it, both generally just because of your environment and specifically because of persecution, right? Specifically, they're going to be attacked and they're going to be destroyed. Progressively worse here very soon. Right. Okay, um, why is John using horses? Uh, if you back up to Zechariah 1... Okay, uh, that is where the image of the horses come from. And it's, it's kind of an amalgam of two different ways he uses this. Um, they're first mentioned in chapter 1, and they're mentioned in, in more detail in chapter 6. Why he would have picked horses is, is a detail that, that does matter. Zechariah 1.8, um, he sees a vision in 1 and verse 7. He says, I saw at night, and behold, a man riding on a white horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine, with red sorrel and white horses behind him. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? The angel who was speaking with me said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, here's the important line, These are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth 
So they answered the angel of the Lord, standing among the myrtle trees, and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth's peaceful and quiet. Now, why are they on horses? It's, it's pretty easy. It's a, it's, a, it's a speed, control, conquest type thing. Exactly right. It's the Wells Fargo of the day, right? Like, not the loan people, but the, the Pony Express, right? It's a symbol that you can control a wide amount of land effectively, right? It's a, it's a controlling, conquesting type, type image. It's the same thing in Zechariah 6, right? Zechariah 6, he again sees a vision, and um, there are chariots in this one, but the first chariot, Zechariah 6, 2, has red horses, the second one, black horses, the third one, white horses, and the fourth one, dappled horses, right? Verse 5, these are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth, right? In verse 7 of that same chapter, they were eager to patrol the earth, and so they patrolled the earth, right? It's this idea of they're not just walking around, they're running around on horses. It's a widespread control sort of image. So this tells our readers in Revelation, whatever this is, whatever this, is this is not just Jerusalem. This isn't just the city of Rome or just the city of Ephesus. This is everywhere. This is a general all-over problem. Yeah. Doesn't it appear, though, often God seems to discourage the use of horses? Oh, 100%. By the Israelites and yeah. and so forth. So it's just, it's interesting. We were talking about that last night. We were talking about this. It's just interesting that that's, I understand there's logistics and movement and blah, 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 but it's just interesting he chooses horses. Yeah. Horses represent military power, <laughs> right? And God didn't want His people depending on military power, which is actually, you know, everyone loves Solomon, but Solomon had like eleven thousand horses. Okay, he's not he's not exactly on the on the you know, on the right side of things there. Anyway, a whole other thing. But you're right; it, it represents military power in, in that sense. Okay, um, maybe the most important question of the morning: What are the two questions asked in the chapter? These two questions matter a lot to the whole story of Revelation. There are two questions asked. What's the first one? How long, sovereign Lord, would, will it take you to judge the inhabitants of the earth to avenge our blood? That's exactly right. The first two words are, how long? Right? How long until this is over? How important would that have been to John's readers? Right? The persecuted, the Christians, the ones going through the things described, the war, the famine, the death, and the martyrs, the ones who have been killed for their faith. They ask God, how long? What's the answer? I didn't make the connection earlier that you said it, but I guess I read two of the, uh, of the air, I guess. But when I, I was going to ask you, well, why would they ask to avenge their blood? You know, these guys that are under this law, well, obviously, they're martyrs. They've been martyred for their faith. They see what has happened. This, an injustice has gone on. We have been destroyed for our faith. And so they're asking, how long do we have to, to wait for justice? They understand justice needs to be done. How long? And really that question, it comes from the Old Testament too, but that question generally is important. I mean, how long do we have to wait for Christ to come back? Even if we're not martyred, even if we live a comfortable life and die comfortably. It's like, how long until the promises come true, right? This, this question of how long is, is one of the most important throughout the Bible, but especially in Revelation. Now, what's the answer that they're given? Because the question of how long is answered here. Until whose death stops? Your fellow servants, your brethren. Okay. So this is... Yeah. I just thought it was interesting because I couldn't think of another instance where that exactly happened that way. Yeah, it, it is, it's unique, right? It, it, and a lot of the way John uses his images is, is unique, but they're, they're told in essence just, just hang on a little longer, right? It's not quite, not quite over yet. And this one, this one covers you. Put this white robe up. Yeah. Help you. Not quite. Well, and it's a marker, it's a symbol. You are among my people. You are, we're on good terms, yeah. right? Um, 
this is a this is a similar thing. So they're told how long here, um, how long it would be until they'd have to wait. Not the first time um, we've seen that either. Of course, my notes are somewhere else. Um, Genesis 15 and verse 16. God has answered this same sort of question, maybe from the other direction, but, but the same kind of thing. Genesis 15 and verse 16. God is, is telling Abram, this is what's going to happen. Your people are going to go live in a land that's not theirs. They're going to dwell there for 400 years. Think, bad things are going to happen. But in verse 16, he says, Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. You hear that? The things that the Amorites are not quite ripe enough to be picked, you know, in a bad sense. It's not quite time, is God's answer in, in Genesis 15 to the, the iniquity of the Amorites. The other side of this question is in Revelation 6, right? How long do we have to wait until you avenge our blood? Well, until it's over, <laughs> until it's finished, till it's complete. Then, then it will come to pass. That's the version you... Oh, sorry. What's the second question? Who can stand or who is able to stand at the end of verse 17? Who is able to stand is not answered in this chapter, but it's answered immediately in chapter 7. Right? Uh, just if you have your Bible, look at it with me. In Revelation 6, 17, it says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who is standing in verse 9 of chapter 7? True, true. Yeah, 15 tells you they cannot stand. But 7 in verse 9, he sees a great multitude from, you know, no one could count, every nation, all tribes, people's tongues, standing. So there's the answer to the question at the end of verse chapter 6. Who can stand? And then in Revelation, you turn to this innumerable number of people standing, right? So there's that, that group of people really, really matters. Okay, um... The breaking of the sixth seal, we haven't talked about this one yet, is an Old Testament image, it's super common. What event's being described? And it's seal number six. The idea of a nation falling, that this reminds me of... Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a symbol that in Matthew 24, it's precisely the same language he uses there, right? My question is, what day is being described? The day of judgment. It's sometimes called what? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. It's the fall, but if you will, it's the fall of a nation and somebody losing their power. It is, it is the day God arrives and affects change on whatever the situation is. The day God shows up and does what He does. That's the day of the Lord. It can either be positive or negative. If it's negative, that means you're on the wicked side, right? God has, a, has come to destroy you. That day came for Israel a number of times. It could also mean a day of deliverance. If you're the people that are oppressed, if you're Israel in Egypt, if you're the Israelites in Babylon, if you're you know the Israelites when Midian shows up. There's a day when God comes and He destroys the enemies and saves you. Speaking of that, Joel 2 okay, is, is one of the best places to see it. Um, it Joel 2 describes God's arrival at the very gate of Jerusalem because of Jerusalem's wickedness. Okay, Jerusalem has been evil, and so it describes God uh, coming in almost as a locust plague, prepared to just annihilate them. Listen to the language. Uh, Joel, Joel 2.10 Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord utters His voice before His army. Surely His camp is very great, for strong is He who carries out His word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? That's the kind of the, the peak moment in this, this scene in Joel 2. God's here. Who can stand, right? Now go back to Revelation 6 again. 
He broke the sixth seal. There's a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The whole moon became like blood. The star of the sky fell to the earth, and so on and so forth. He's not being literal. He's using that cataclysmic, you know, chicken little type language, right? The sky is falling. Is that that sort of idea? He's describing the day when God comes to do what He promised to do in the fifth seal. He promised in the fifth seal to avenge the martyrs, right? To, to deal with the injustice of them being destroyed. And then in the very next seal, He's here. And it's all breaking loose. By the way, uh, the sky split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. Does that sound familiar? You've heard that sort of language before somewhere else? We had a scroll written on front and back there. Okay. Um, the skies being parted is a common image too. Okay. It, it occurs. It occurs quite a bit. Um, Isaiah thirty-four specifically is the place where you'll see that. Um, Isaiah thirty-four, I believe it's verse four. Yeah. So. The same type of language being used. All the hosts of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up as a scroll. All their hosts will also wither away as leaf withers from the vine. Same kind of language. There it's describing God judging Edom. But here it's God judging the wicked. Yes, sir? What do you say when God comes? Say that again? I'm sorry. What do you, what you say? When God comes to avenge the, the death of His servants. So final judgment is the idea. That's the, the ultimate day when God comes to do that. Does that make sense? I don't. Is, is your question is going to be Jesus judging or God judging? Is that what you're asking? Well, go back to chapter 21. And it says that all this is going to come, come to pass shortly. Mm -hmm. So is shortly still working? Yeah, he's showing a. a from the coming of the kingdom until the coming of Christ. That's what the seals are they're showing, the, the whole picture. Right? So in, in one they're still in the middle of that process. The final judgment hasn't happened yet. Does that make sense? In other words, we're, we're going to be in the final judgment. Mm -hmm. It hasn't come to pass yet. But this is describing here's what will happen on that when that day comes. Yeah. Exactly. One of those will be, the last one will be the second coming of Christ, second mm -hmm. church of Christ. That will be a day of the Lord. Right. But we had other days of the Lord already where other na when nations were judged. That wasn't Christ coming in his final judgment of all mankind, but rather coming in judgment against a particular people. Mm -hmm. There's a great version of that in Matthew 24, right? <laughs> Matthew 24, when Jesus is describing the judgment that's coming against Jerusalem, right? Well, you, you get that same, I'm sorry, not the judgment of Jerusalem, but the final judgment that follows that, I'm sorry, the, the final day of the Lord. Matthew 24, 29 uh, and following uses that same sort of language when Christ returns. There were three questions that he was answering. When, when will these things be? The, the temple, there won't be a stone left on another. When will these be? And when, what, what is the sign of thy coming? Mm -hmm. So he answers those. He's answering the last one. There's multiple questions being answered. Yeah, And that's a good point. There are multiple days of the Lord. This is describing the last one. And so it uses the same language. Uh, yep. Yeah. And I, I think this one is special too because it includes literally everyone. Mm -hmm. Not, it says the kings of the earth, princes, generals, rich, and the mighty, and every slave, yep. every freedman. They're the ones hiding in caves saying, just bring the rock, just drop the mountains on us, right? This is so bad. I don't want to be anywhere near the one that sits on the throne. You know, it, it encompasses that's right. everyone in that. Yeah, and that's and I, I'm glad that, that you notice that in 15, right? It goes from kings to slaves and everyone in between. <laughs> What's the moral character of the kings from kings to slave in this case? I'm sorry. <laughs> Because of the God of Christ. 
I believe so. It's in, in John's time, it would have been just the ones who had died. We can certainly extend that to, to think about they might all be in that group. It would, it would be then everybody that's killed with Christ, and we can think of it the same way as everybody for us too. It's the same, it, the image applies, right? Um, what was I talking about? I lost my train of thought. Oh, okay. What's the what's the moral character of the people in fifteen and sixteen? Are they are they good? Are they bad? Who who are they? I would assume they're they're bad because it's the people who want the rocks. They don't want to be judged. That's right. Like in Romans eight one, there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In Jesus, we're saved, as you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Who fears in verse sixteen the wrath of the Lamb? It's not the Lamb's followers. It's not Christians. It's the enemies, right? Plus, I've always thought, and this is a complete side note, but I've always thought wrath of the lamb to be a weird thing because you never think about lambs and wrath, right? You think about lambs and sweet, cute, Easter, that kind of thing. This lamb's different, right? <laughs> this lamb was dead and is now alive, and now he's come to, to rectify the situation. And the other part of this that does obviously images John portrays. Yes. Right. Wait, is he opening the seals or is he on the horse? Right. <laughs> Both. So we can't take it literally. You can't take it literally. It's describing a, it's a story. It's describing a series of events. It's right. It's a picture that mm -hmm. describes, trying to give it us in, our, in words we can understand. Yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, it's the wicked here in 15 and 16 who fear the wrath of the Lamb, right? For the great day of, also, remember we've said this before, Revelation often uses language to describe God, to describe Jesus, and they're often interchangeable, right? Jesus and the, or rather, God and the Lamb are together in chapter 5. In 6 and verse 16, hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So it's, they're both together. Their, their wrath and their justice is considered simultaneous. And then in 17, for the great day of their wrath has come. So it's not like we have God who's judging and Jesus who's the sidekick. No, it's they're together in this, right? All right, uh, eight. Oh, Malachi three two. There's a cry in Revelation six that's an echo of something we see right at the end of the Old Testament, right? Malachi three verse two. Um, in Malachi three one, we'll begin. Behold, I am going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me. Who's that talking about? I would, yeah, John the Baptist, okay? Before me would be before Christ, right? Before himself. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. A person coming to purify a people to then stand before God. That should sound familiar, right? Who are those people in Revelation 6? They're the ones wearing the white. They're the ones that have been cleansed. They're the holy ones. Malachi asks the question, who can stand before this person? He is a purifier. He is a refiner. He either purifies what's there or he burns up what's there. What's left? There's no you know, middle ground, right? You either be pure or you get burned up. And the same question is asked in Revelation 6. Who can stand before this person, right? Okay. Other stuff you saw when you read the text. What did you think? We got a lot of it already, but what did you see? What did you notice? What did you find interesting as you read through? Yep. talk about a vision. They're, they're, they're painting a vision with words. Mm -hmm. And it appears that the almost the, the use of the scroll it kind of rules out, if you will, mm -hmm. the vision before them. And it just seems so so beautiful, just so visual 
But you see, this, as the scroll rolls out, all these things are revealed. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a countdown of sorts, right? It's a before we can open the book and see who's in the book of life, these other things have to happen. And these other things are going to happen. It's a, it's a device, right? It's a device meant to make a point. But you can see the scroll zoom and roll. Yeah, you can kind of... It's, it's getting closer and closer and closer uh, to the end, which is frustrating because the seventh seal doesn't get opened for a while. <laughs> um, it's just after this, and then we do some other stuff. But So it's a bit of a you know cliffhanger. All right. What else did you see in chapter 6 that you thought interesting or different or odd? All right, well, so a couple of things. Number one, um, come back to the third seal, the seal having to do with famine. Um, my version, it translates it into modern measurements. It says in verse 6, a quart of wheat for a denarius, right? So a quart of wheat for a denarius. Any idea how much, wheat, how much flour you get out of a quart of wheat? I know, I know we all ground our own wheat this morning to make bread, right? I, I know that happened. Any idea how much that, that is? If you went to buy flour of an equivalent amount, it's like a pound and a third. It's like a pound and a third of flour. And most people, from what I was reading, that's about how much flour you would get, right? Basically, you know, a little over a handful. So, like we talked about earlier, a denarius was how much of a wage? A day's wage for a common, everyday person, right? What would you think would a day's wage would be today, roughly, on average? A couple hundred bucks. And that's probably being generous for some folks, right? If you work a whole day, you might make two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars for that much flour. That translates well to us, right? That's that's outrageous. You're barely work. You're working enough only to feed yourself for that day, not counting rent and whatever else has to happen, right? What about the three quarts of barley? Why throw that in there? Because people didn't eat barley, generally, unless you had to, unless you were starving. Who does eat barley? Animals. Oh, animals, and specifically horses. Uh, from what I was, you know, this is. So you work all day to make barely enough for yourself, and maybe not even enough for your animal, right? I don't know what the. I don't know how much barley a horse eats, but I would assume it's more than this, right, in a day. This is a terrible situation going on, right? This is economic uh, destruction that, that's happening here. Things are going to get bad, and they're going to get bad on a couple of different levels. Not just, you know, fear of death from, person, from you know, being killed, but famine's going to become a very real thing. Um, also, in the fourth seal, notice in verse 8, um, how much of the earth is being killed? A fourth. Why a fourth? Why not the whole earth? Why, why is it some fraction of the whole earth? What's the point of that? Well, he's, he's told oh. us a square of uh, It's the horrendous being saved. Yeah, it's death, but it's not death as in a global sense, right? As in there's some going to be... I'm going to use the word, there's going to be a great apocalypse that happens and we're all going to, you know. I'm sorry, we are not going to kill everyone on earth. That's not our prerogative, right? Death is going to occur, but it's not going to occur to, you know, 99% of the world. It's, it's limited in some sense, right? It's not going to be uh, global in that, in that idea. Uh, at the end of verse 8, also, again, another thing John pulls out, sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts of the earth. Ezekiel 14 uses those same four things in order, right? The same four things that tend to attack and destroy and kill people. John uses it again to describe what he's describing, okay? All right, um, other stuff. I don't remember. Do, 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 do. We did that, we did that, we did that. Um, talked about that one, talked about that one. Oh, the last one, the hiding in the caves. There are a couple of stories from the Old Testament of people being afraid and running away and hiding in caves. Okay, Joshua 10 is one of the first ones. Um, the people of Israel, they're coming in to conquer the land, and they encounter a bunch of kings, and the five kings run and flee and hide in the cave. Does anyone remember from your, uh, not OBS, what's the thing? OSH. OSH. What happens to the kings in that story? Do you remember? Joshua finds them. 
They're, well, they're sealed until Joshua can get there. And then they're dragged out and then they're killed anyway. What will happen to those who hide in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains in Revelation 6? They can hide all they want. They're not going to escape judgment. Right? They can hide all they want. They can even beg that the mountains fall on top of them. They would rather the mountain fall on them than to face the wrath of the Lamb. Right? Judgment's a very real thing. And those who are encountering, those who are approaching judgment with knowledge of what's going on, they want no part of it. Right? The great day of their wrath has come. They will not be able to stand. Uh, let me see. Oh, I thought about this too. Um, I find it a bit ironic. In Hebrews 11, in verse 38, I thought about this just, 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 just the other day. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 36, you know, begins describing the, the terrible things that are happening to the persecuted, right? Uh, they're in prison, they mock, they're scourged, they're sawn in two in verse 37. It says in verse 38, Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Hebrews 11 describes the persecuted hiding in holes in the ground. But Hebrews 6 turns it around and says, no, it's the wicked who will hide in holes in the ground. The persecuted, according to Revelation 6, even though they're killed, are told, wait a little while, you're given a white robe, it will all be dealt with shortly. Where the wicked who chase them around into those caves find themselves in caves themselves, right? Saying, please let us die here. We don't want to see God. Right? Isn't that interesting? Turn of events, right? Anyway, I, I, thought that was, I thought that was really, really cool. It happens a lot in Scripture. Okay, what should they learn from this in their time period? What are the big lessons the Romans, or rather the Christians in Rome, learn from Revelation 6, right? What are the big points? Even though they're suffering, there is a conqueror. There is someone who will prevail. Mm-hmm. An injustice has been done. They've died on the right side of things, and God will make it right one day. Um, not yet, you know, is this sort of the big picture there, but, but it will happen. And the wicked who chase them will themselves have to stand that judgment. Okay, what else? I was going to say, they are, I was, I was going to say, those that die in Christ are remembered. They're not forgotten. Right, right. So along with that, right, it, God knows who's there. That book that he's holding is a testament to that too. He knows who's written there, and it's we have to wait a little while longer. Not all the names are written there yet, maybe as a way to think about it. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that I think one of the things we have seen is how Jesus becomes more prominent. It's it's like God is turning over responsibilities to Jesus right before our eyes. Yeah. And and I think that would have been fascinating to the Israelites to see the Messiah and the role that he is will assume because we know he will judge in the end, but but just to see that would have been, I think, very educational to them. Yeah, the kingdoms, and it's and it's different than it was the last time. It's different and better, and worse in in, in senses, right? But it does eventually work out in the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's a good point. This is the one God promised. What He never promised was again another physical kingdom. He promised something of this variety, right? All right. Um, let me think. Do 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 do. Yeah. Persecution is going to be bad. It's going to be bad in all sorts of different ways. God's going to take vengeance on the wicked. Uh, in the end, the wicked are going to they're going to wish they hadn't been there. They're going to wish something else would have happened rather than stand before Christ, right? The Jews, or rather, the Christians are on the right side of things. Okay. Um, yeah, we ran out of time. Okay, there's a lot of other stuff here we could have talked about. Next week, we're going to get to that group in Revelation 7, the great multitude. Um, the question at the end of chapter 6 answers in chapter 7, so you want to read those together. And um, well, Actually, not next Sunday. I guess it would be 